uh, what a privilege and pleasure it is for me uh, to share this platform this morning. Uh, thank you, Tamu, for sacrificially creating these platforms all over the world. And I have such a privilege of being on this platform today to share some of the things that God has laid upon my heart. Uh, if you are falling asleep, uh, feel like falling asleep, uh, just stand up, shout hallelujah, and sit down. And, and everyone will start looking at you. You won't fall asleep again. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about, about migration. This has been a very significant uh, subject uh, in the last two decades, uh, starting for us from uh, 1992 and culminating in 1994. And there are several passages of Scripture that deal with this both uh, uh, typologically and migration has been uh, sort of the bedrock for us within this apostolic season, particularly shifting from a Pentecostal charismatic mindset to an apostolic prophetic mindset. And that journey has spanned uh, two decades and it is still continuing. And uh, so, Although you'll see us preaching from one spot today, please remember we were once very, very dramatic, charismatic uh, Pentecostal uh, preachers. We know how to uh, pray for people and they fall down. And when they don't fall down, we push them. <laughs> and uh, we also were very skilled in tripping people if they did not fall. So we are used to all of that stuff. But the Pentecostal charismatic movement was incomplete and uh, we, we really love that, that season, beautiful season, but it's a new season now, and, uh, and God is, is bringing us into the process of migration. The Bible says, blessed is a man whose heart is set on pilgrimage. And there are several passages of Scripture that we use to refer to migration. We used, uh, for instance, the Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, where the younger son arose and came to the father of the house, but the elder son arose and came to the house of the father. And so you find two kinds of sons in the house, and the whole of Luke chapter 15 deals with that kind of dynamic. Then you could look at Abraham's migration, how his long journey led him to offload many things. And then you look at uh, Naomi, Ruth Naomi migration, the four lepers, the nation of Israel coming out of Babylon, the lame man at the gate, beautiful. And in John chapter 5, the impotent man, where Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. And that's coded language for change your position, disconnection, and change your location. And this message of migration spans 20 years. And I'll deal with it in a more typological manner today, reading from Numbers chapter 33, from verse number 1. And this is what it reads. These are the journeys of the children of Israel which went forth out of the land of Egypt with the armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote the goings out according to their journeys by the commandments of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to the goings out. And they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Among their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And the children of Israel removed from Ramesses and pitched in Sukkot. And they departed from Sukkot and pitched in Etham, which is in the edge of the wilderness. So the exit point for the children of Israel was Ramesses. Thereafter, they had to pass through 42 stations before they settled in the Promised Land. And each of these stations, uh, there were several things encrypted in each of these stations. In each of these stations, God wanted certain attributes, characteristics added to them, to their lives, or He wanted certain things deleted. So each of these stations significantly point to the demands of migration. Notice the exit point was Ramesses, and they had to leave in the first month. 
and first is the number of the apostolic in Greek it's proton, it's the proton principle, and this is the first step in our salvation. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. There is no migration without our translation out of the system of this world. And I submit to you that much of Pentecostal charismatic ministry and churches have now defaulted into a worldly pattern, have adopted Egyptian tapestry, and are operating according to the philosophy and the principles of this world. It's not strange to go into a church and see drunkenness, to see all kinds of, of patterns of immoral behavior that characterizes Pentecostalism and Charismania. And the movement, the shift had to take place on the 15th day, on the 15th day of the first month. And 15 is very significant. This is the number of triple grace. Our migration is grace enabled and multiplied grace is required for multiplied movements. Joseph gave his family Ramesses as Pharaoh commanded. And Israel built Ramesses as a treasure city. That which was a gift became a curse because this is where taskmasters were appointed to oppress them. Now the word Ramesses, this was the exit point. Ramesses means son of the sun, S-O-N of the S-U-N. And in the apostolic season, we have heard several characteristics of spiritual sonship. For more than a decade now, we have known that these characteristics uh, in a son, a shift from membership to sonship, what should you expect from a son in the house that he'll submit to his spiritual father, he'll take ownership of the vision of his father, he may carry some characteristics of his father, he would honor his father, he would be intimate with his father, and he'd protect the father and he'd protect the vision. But that's a stepping stone to divine sonship. Divine sonship has its own characteristics, which is self-control, sobriety. The Bible says we are sons of the day and not of the night, therefore walk and be sober. The Bible says another characteristic of divine sonship is over the ability to overcome. He who overcomes shall sit with me on my throne and be my son. The, the, the divine son as the nature of the heavenly father he is sensitive to the Spirit, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. He walks in intimacy with God. He recognizes God as Heavenly Father, and he's on a journey of perfection. And we have processed these in the last decade, particularly in many of Tamunaida schools. But here you see a new paradigm. You see the nation of Israel, slaves in Egypt, in Ramesses, and Ramesses means son of the S-U-N. Now, there are important spiritual principles that can be gleaned from this kind of sonship. You must understand that when I say son of the sun, S-U-N, it means the individual follows the natural son. The son is his father. He is a sun worshiper. He is a son of natural light. Ultimately, he worships the sun god Ra, and Ra means evil. He follows natural light. He does not and cannot follow the spirit. There are three main characteristics of sun worshipers. Firstly, they are governed by sight. They are governed by their natural eyes. They have no spiritual sight. Success is measured by externals, dress code, age code, national code, gender code, educational code, race code, numbers, building, cash, etc. And this has been the way many churches and many believers have operated. In wanting a visible God, the nation of Israel became idol worshippers. The latent defect manifested later 
in the golden calf incident with Aaron. The second thing about son of the S-U-N is that their lives are determined by seasons. The sun determines the seasons. These believers are seasonal. They are governed by the Gregorian calendar. They cannot function spiritually on public holidays. <laughs> we are not employees. We are sons of God. We live in the light, not under the light. The third characteristic of the son of the S-U-N is that he is secular. They worship natural light. They are naturalized. They have assimilated the culture of the world. Ezekiel 8, 16 says, He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their face towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Their backs were turned to the Shekinah glory, and they worshipped natural light. They surrendered to natural light. Natural light is a symbol of the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of this world is foolishness. Natural light was not permitted in the holy place. It was uniquely illuminated by the candlestick. There are certain things we have to know about the natural man. The natural man cannot receive the things of God. Even if he has got a double PhD in English, he cannot receive the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14. A natural man is not saved. Ephesians 2 from verse 1 to 8. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So you could go and read all of that, and it's ample proof that in times past, as natural men, as mere men, we walked according to the course of this world, being governed by the prince of the power of the earth. The natural man is carnal. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So a natural man is carnal, is ceremonial, is governed by works of the flesh, he walks in neglect, there's an absence of conviction, he is immature, he is tribalistic, and he yields quickly to the flesh. The natural man, the son of the S-U-N, the one that has assimilated the culture of Ramesses, follows the doctrine of secularity. And the doctrine of secularity, which has, which has surreptitiously crept into many Pentecostal charismatic churches, is humanism, modernism, postmodernism, and existentialism. And existentialism is when you exalt experience above the scriptures. The son of the S-U-N started long before Ramesses. In fact, the Chaldeans were also sun worshippers. The Assyrians were sun worshippers. Egyptians, sun worshippers. Medo-Persians, sun worshippers. Greece worshipped the sun. They worshipped the sun god Helios. And Helios is a very famous name, particularly among the Indian community in Phoenix and Chatsworth. <laughs> so sun worship in Egypt eventually evolved and became perfected in Greece. And uh, you had people like Protagoras, and you had people like Heraclitus, 
500 BC, who, uh, who were proponents of humanism and secularism, uh, where man is a measure of all things. And this has crept into our churches. If you look at the Greek mindset and the Hebrew mindset, of vast differences in the thinking patterns. The Greeks focus on knowledge and revelation. The Hebrew focuses on implementation. The Greek focuses on appearance, but the Hebrew focuses on function. Greeks are precise. It's black or white, but with Hebrews, Scripture has several layers of meanings. It could be literal or straightforward. It could be implied. It could be analogical. It could be moralistic, or there could be an hidden meaning applicable for today. The, Gre the Hebrew would say, what must I do? The Greek would say, why must I do it? The ultimate goal of the Hebrew was to follow God. The ultimate goal of the Greek was self-expression. The Hebrew relied on God and was faith-driven. The Greek relied on reason. The, in, the, the, the Hebrew was community-orientated. The Greeks were individualistic. The Hebrew pursued signs, wonders, and believed in the supernatural. But the Greeks sought wisdom. Greek thinking is linear. Hebrew thinking is cyclical. By linear, I mean there's movement from one step to the next step to the next step. And you have to complete the one step before you could move to the next step. But the Hebrew thinking was cyclical. You could start anywhere, and there's a lot of repetition. Our method in the apostolic season includes both. But in the main, it includes following, serving, and imitating a spiritual father. The Hebrew focused on his relationship with God. The Greek focused on the attributes of God. The Greek mindset is competitive. The Hebrew mindset is complementary. The Greeks were man-centered. The Hebrew was God-centered. To the Greek, he believed in chance. The Hebrew believed that God controlled everything. Abraham Eshel writes, the Greeks learned in order to comprehend. The Hebrew learned in order to revere and to worship. Modern man learns in order to use. The sons of Zion are neither Greek nor Hebrew. They are moved to a biblical culture of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and it may include all three. There are several features, other features of the sons of the SUN. I do not have time to process all of them, but I'm quickly going to mention some of them. You must understand, when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they left under the hand of Moses and Aaron. They left under a grace configuration because that's what and represents. But the son of the S-U-N lives in the realm of vanity. Ecclesiastes 1.14 says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. The son of the S-U-N lives under the sun, operates under the sun. He does not operate under grace, and he lives in the realm of vanity, which is meaningless and emptiness. hundred years from now, no one will remember you. The world won't remember your prizes. They won't remember your medals and accolades. They won't remember that you are a bishop. They won't remember the car you drive. They won't remember the clothes you wore. They won't remember your education. A hundred years from now, what for some of you will be tomorrow, some people will not remember you. <laughs> the Bible says in James 4.14, whereas as you do not know what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So because we understand the vanity and meaningless of being under the sun, we must build with eternal values. And the Bible says the word of the Lord endures forever. And the context 
of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 onwards, when Paul says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual but as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, but hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. And he continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, there are two categories of building. You can build gold, silver, and precious stones, which are derivatives of the rock, and the rock is Christ, and Christ is the Word, or you can build wood, stubble, and hay, which are derivatives of the sand. And in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that talks about doctrine. So building eternity in your church is building doctrine into the lives of men and women, and that delivers them from the entire problem of the issue of vanity. Secondly, sons of the S-U-N have no profit. Ecclesiastes 1.3, what profit is a man of all his labor which he takes under the sun? The Bible implies that there is no gain or advantage, yet in the kingdom of God there is reward. And I do not have time to go through the rewards with you. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, The things that have been seen, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Please understand, there is no new revelation. Sons of the S-U-N cannot walk in newness. There is nothing new as far as creation is concerned. Death and life continues. Sun rises and the sun sets. There's high tide and there's low tide. The rivers flow into the sea. Vices are as in the days of Noah and Lot. Yes, there is nothing new as far as creation is concerned. But if you talk to a medical practitioner, he'll tell you there are lots of new things taking place. There are new inventions taking place. There is MRI scan and all kinds of different kinds of scans right now. So the context is within the episode of creation. But in Christ, we are constantly exposed to new dimensions, to new things. The Bible says we should walk in the newness of life. In Christ, we are exposed to the supernatural. The destruction of Korah was a new thing. Healing signs and wonders, new things. Resurrection, new things. Incarnation, new thing. And the proceeding word, the way the scriptures are interpreted in this apostolic reformation in terms not only of the Old Testament typology, but a New Testament typology, and how that becomes the proceeding word. There are new things in Christ. Sons of the S-U-N live in regret because wealth is left to another. Ecclesiastes 2.18 Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it to another man after me. Sons of the S-U-N walk in their own labor and have no rest. Ecclesiastes 2.22, For what hath man for all his labor and the vexation of his heart, wherein he has labored under the sun? Your own labor is imperiled with sorrows as you walk hard, and harder, you find you need more and more insurance. You, know, you need more insurance for your house, more insurance for your car, more insurance for your life, more insurance for your funeral, more insurance for your health, and your valuables, and your levies, and your rates, and it carries on and on. Sons of God operate in Christ. They operate from the position of rest and do not lean on the arm of flesh. Sons of the S-U-N have a naked return. The Bible says, Therefore, in Ecclesiastes 5.13, there is a sore evil 
which I've seen under the sun. Verse 15, as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return. Sons of God do not have a naked return. They can take souls with them. They can lay treasure in heaven. Sons of the SUN have a limitation of revelation. Ecclesiastes 8, 17. I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out. There are certain things a natural man cannot find out, but the spiritual man can say, I have not seen, he has not heard, mind has not conceived, but God has revealed deep things and spiritual things to the people of God. The eighth point, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 15. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For the son of the SUN, there is no better thing than to eat, drink, and be merry. But for the sons of God, there are greater things. The Bible says the glory of the lad house is greater than the glory of the former house. The Bible says you are greater than John the Baptist. The Bible talks of a greater command. The Bible talks of greater works. The Bible talks of greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible talks of a greater name. The Bible talks of a better covenant. The Bible talks of things that accompany salvation. And the list goes on. In Ecclesiastes 9:11, I returned and saw under the sun. This represents the son of the SUN, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happened to all of them. Sons of the SUN, do not believe in intelligent design. They are existentialists. For us, there is hope. Our hope is in Christ. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them of them all. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want to say to you, we do not live by chance. We do not walk by chance. There's nothing accidental in your life. It has been foreordained. It has been planned. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and God is in charge. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 9.13, under the sun, a poor man's wisdom is despised. This is the son who lives under the S-U-N. But in the kingdom of God, there is no prejudice. A poor man can and should be heard just as blind Bartimaeus was heard. We worship God, the one who created and controls the sun. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He was the one who said to Hezekiah, I will move the sundial 10 degrees backwards. We serve a God who controls the sun. We serve a God with Joshua experience, a God who is able to make the sun stand still. So we have this, this, this reality, this reality where there's been an evolution taking place, and it started probably in the Chaldean Empire, moved on to the Assyrian Empire, uh, uh, flowered in Egypt, but then matured in Greece. And so the son of the SUN is now called the son of Greece. Although even Rome worshipped the sun, although the Romans conquered militarily, Greece conquered intellectually. Much of the, 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 much of the world today, much of Western thinking is shaped by Greece. A lot of our churches are operating under the principles of Greece without even knowing it. Operating under natural light, secularism, humanism, modernism, postmodernism. 
Even the person who hasn't been to school, if he comes to some of our churches today, he becomes a postmodernist without even knowing it. Or he becomes an existentialist without even knowing it. The sons of Greece are the offspring of human philosophy. Notice that when you look at the image of Nebuchadnezzar, you have the head of gold, then you have uh, iron, and then you have bronze. Iron was the, or rather, you have silver, which was the Medo-Persian Empire, and then you had uh, the Grecian Empire around the loins. That represents the reproduction, reproductive capacity of the Grecian Empire that it has now reproduced itself within many cultures. And uh, we have the sons of Greece pervading the church and operating under human philosophy. These are, there are several perverse sons mentioned in the Bible. We have the sons of Baal, we have the sons of Sceva, who are the sons of the left hand, we have the sons of the night, we have the sons of the devil, we have the sons of perdition, and all of these are operating with Greek mindsets. And it is in that context I want to declare to you the great war that's going to take place and continues to take place in the church. And it says in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13, he says, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up you sons of Zion against your sons, O Greece, and made you as a sword of a mighty hand, of a mighty man. The battle in this end time is between the sons of Greece, who are in our churches, and the sons of God, or the sons of Zion, also known as the sons of grace. Our battle is between the sons of Greece and the sons of grace. This is an intelligent battle. We are dealing with people who have got PhDs, doctorates. We are dealing with people that are Bible school graduates, but are devoid of the Spirit of God. They have been naturalized because they have only been in church for one hour for the whole week. The rest of the time, they have come under the influence of the sun. They have come under the influence of natural light. The world has made, done a great job in naturalizing the believer. And so we have become pastors of sons of Greece. To get the context to this whole story, you have to read it from Zechariah chapter 9, beginning in verse number 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king cometh unto thee. I'm reading from the old King James Version. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and on upon a colt, the foal of an ass. What you see in verse 9 of Zechariah 9 is the do is, is Christ the king coming upon a donkey and the foal of a donkey. He is riding, as Matthew 21 will fulfill the scripture, he is riding into the city on two donkeys, not one donkey. He is riding on the donkey and the foal. He is riding allegorically, metaphorically, upon father and son. The greatest shift that must take place within our churches is a shift from membership to sonship. Pastors have to shift from being lecturers to fathers. And so this picture is Christ coming into the city and it's already been fulfilled, but the scriptures must be read as a living scripture. It takes place initially, progressively, and consummately. That means he came on the wineskin of father and son and continues to come in the wineskin of father and son. And that's how he continues to come into our churches. 
So if our churches are not crafted according to the demands of heaven, according to the utterance from another realm, according to the daba, according to the rhema, where this interpretation is brought to life, and you still have a membership situation in your church, you will not win in this battle with the sons of Greece. The church must not operate on an employer-employee contract. This migration is now demanded. The Bible says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the os. I do not have time to go through the father-son wineskin with you, but you could go revise Malachi, which talks about God turning the heart of the fathers to the sons, etc. And you could go read the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And David said to Mephibosheth as a pattern, from today onwards, Mephibosheth, you will sit at my table, eat my food continually, and you will be my son. The tabernacle of David is crafted on a father-son wineskin. And the apostle James stood up in the Jerusalem council and declared the fulfillment of that prophecy. And it must continue to take place today with a father-son wineskin in all our churches. I believe this is a rhema. This is more than 10 years old. Pastors that do not shift into this paradigm will have much more to lose than to gain. And God says that I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from river into the ends of the earth. This wineskin, father and son, will bring in the peace of God. The symbols of war used in this scripture, chariot, horse, Battle bow, all being cut off, implies the breaking of the curse, the breaking of strife and contentions. We come out of a charismatic Pentecostal era where strife and contentions are rife and were rife in the churches. I mean, during our tea break, two of our city elders were sitting in one corner, and I was talking to Pastor Jacob, and I was saying to Pastor Jacob, Pastor Jacob, if this was a whole season, I would have had to send a spy to check out what they're talking about. <laughs> but in this season, if you see two of your elders talking, they are conspiring to buy a car for you. <laughs> oh, they are planning your 50th birthday. Amen. Isn't this a wonderful season? We don't have the strife and contention. We don't have Jezebel in our church anymore. We don't have Absaloms. We don't have Korahs. Oh, these things were charismatic problems. We don't have religious spirit, false brethren, Assyrian attacks, Babylonian attacks. At the inception of this apostolic season, these principalities were publicly decapitated in our cities. In our cities, churches used to split, one particular church split 17 times. When it came into the apostolic season, order came into the house. This is a season of great order. This wineskin will usher in the dominion of the church that Sean alluded to when the Bible speaks about his dominion shall be from sea even to sea. It means from nation to nation. This is a reality of this season that it is not only the priesthood of all believers, it's the kingship of all believers. And that dominion message has to be processed, has to be taught rep repeatedly in our church. The purpose of the parables is not to reveal truth, but to hide truth. And we have to search out the matter to find out the keys of dominion. And that's what apostles and prophets do. They bring out the keys to bring God's people into dominion and rulership. We are positionally kings. We are seated with him in heavenly places. If you are seated with him in heavenly places, you are not going up. You're already seated there. I was explaining to some theologians because they were arguing with me about just two words, caught up. Caught up. The whole doctrine of disappearance is based on the word caught up. And I said to them, we won't go into Greek and Hebrew. Let's look at what's the meaning of the opposite word. 
The opposite word is caught down. So you must know what caught down is before you can define what caught up is. When Adam sinned, he was caught down, and the entire human race was caught down with him. That means he just didn't fall from grace. Adam could navigate between two realms. He could navigate between heaven, and he could navigate between earth. When he was caught down, he just did not fall from grace. He fell from immortality. He became a mere man. He was now subject to death, subject to disease. So when the word now comes, when Jesus comes, we will be caught up. What does that mean? You have to read it in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. That means we inherit our immortal bodies. That means you and I become Superman. <laughs> An immortal being can operate on the earth and in the air. Yeah. It does not have to disappear. It is the manifestation of the sons of God. The whole of creation is groaning, not for the disappearance of the sons of God, but the manifestation. The earth is groaning, not for you to fly away, but for you to appear. So tell your neighbor, I'm coming soon. <laughs> As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. We are beneficiaries as the sons of grace. We are the beneficiaries of a blood covenant, not an employment contract. We are delivered from the pit of darkness and lack. We have been delivered from the pit of wordlessness. That's what word, the pit without water means, wordlessness. We have come in and we, have, we came out of a pit where there was no word. God delivered us from the famine of his word through his covenant. Psalms 40 verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the mighty clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. When you are brought out, verse 12 says, turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Our stronghold is Zion. Our stronghold is the Lord himself. We have been catapulted from the miry pit, from a bottomless pit, into the very stronghold of God, the Zion of God, where we are zealous for God, where we walk in integrity, who shall ascend into the holy hill of God, he who has clean hands, clean heart. We have ascended to that position because we have been made overcomers. The time to favor us has come. The time to favor Zion has come. It is the people of God who have the indwelling presence of God, a people who have come and are coming to maturity. The Bible says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, our God shines. The God is perfecting the church and he's taken the church out of the pit of worldlessness, wordlessness, and put us into a Zion position. And he says in verse 13, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against the sons of Greece, and made thee as a sword of a mighty man. This particular portion of scripture has to be read symbolically. Sadly, many of our churches have been literalized. Here again you see the father-son wineskin. Judah is a father who has the bow in his hand, and Ephraim are his sons. There are many pictures of the father-son wineskin in the Bible. The bow and arrow is a symbol of the father and son. If you, we must have a vision, an ambition to be able to launch our sons to the gates of the city. That's what it means when you see a bow in the Bible. Uh, you cannot just have your, your quiver full of arrows. They have to be launched. Your sons are not your trophies to show everyone. They must be launched into the deep. A mountain and a hill. A mountain is a father. Hill is a son. Donkey and a foal. The donkey is a father, the foal is a son. King and a prince. 
father and son. These all imageries scattered throughout the Bible. They are hidden because God, God's ultimate model is father and son. It's more than ecclesia. It's more than just being called out. The best definition of church is a church which is the family of God. Judah is the bow. Ephraim is the son. And the battle is between the sons of grace and the sons of Greece. Sons will contend at the gate. And the Bible says, and I have made you as a sword of a mighty man. Something is happening on the earth in this apostolic reformation. There is a second incarnation taking place. This is the incarnation of the word of God in the sons of God. This is a marvelous thing. When you squeeze a believer, all you get out of him is the word of the Lord. This is the incarnation that apostles and prophets are after. We declare that the word, word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. The Bible says, and his arrow shall go forth, or rather, verse 14, and the Lord shall be seen over them. This is the manifest, manifest presence of God upon a people. And as this battle rages, a battle between darkness and light, I want you to know that there is a light, there is a presence that will be seen upon the sons of God, a presence of prosperity, the presence of the fear of the Lord, signs, wonders, conviction, emancipation, liberty, all of those things will be displayed upon the sons of God. In the midst of darkness, therefore, the scripture says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This is a season where the glory will be seen, and the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. What is the glory? The glory is not the signs, wonders, and miracles. The glory is the character and the attributes of God, righteousness, holiness, faithfulness, wisdom, truth, love, integrity. That means what you saw in the early church would be magnified in a people in the end. The character of love seen at a deeper level amongst believers. That is the glory of the latter house. And his arrows shall go forth as lightning, as lightning. We started off with many arrows, and now we see one arrow where you see the body coming together and manifesting as one. This is a corporate reality that's going to be seen in every city as city churches, as translocal churches begin to gather and begin to sacrifice their Isaacs. Your local church has become an Isaac to you, and you are Abraham. And for the city church to emerge and for the temple to build, you have to climb up Mount Moriah you have to come to the same place David came, the threshing floor of Arona, and sacrifice your Isaac so that the corporate temple can be built. That's where Solomon's temple was erected. And the corporate temple is a city church. We do not have time to go there. But the arrows shall go forth as lightning. I want you to know, a few years ago, I think about five years ago, I was constantly having dreams of lightning and lightning striking buildings. So what I did was I got some of the skilled lightning technicians in our city and I lightning proof my whole house. So if you come to my house, it's lightning proof. And then as I was studying and looking at the word of the Lord reminded me that that's not what it meant. You don't have to protect yourself and lightning proof your house. What God was saying, that he will raise up his sons as lightning. That means his sons will operate in what is called acceleration. Acceleration. Everything is going to move faster and faster from now onwards. That means you're going to be Flash before you're going to be Superman. <laughs> Everything is going to go faster and faster and faster. And there are many stories in the, in the Word of God that talk about this acceleration. It talks about, as Samu alluded to, the harvest in the third month. In the third month, you're declaring the seventh month. Aaron's rod budding, flowering, and bearing fruit in one night. All the seasons merging together faster and faster. Let and former rain together. Plowmen overtaking the reaper. Water being changed to wine. That's acceleration. There's, there's Elijah overtaking Ahab on his feet. That's acceleration. 
Oh, there's Ezekiel's river. First one measure, knee deep. Then ankle deep, knee deep. Then waist deep. And then suddenly waters to swim in. Where the waters take you. And you begin to see the fruit trees. Oh, there's a woman who's bent over. Just by one touch, she gets straightened out. Or the blind man instantly being healed at the pool of Siloam. Or door opening. So that you don't have to build a road and build a house and build a door. The door just opens long before all of that. A nation born in a day. This time tomorrow. These are all acceleration scriptures. And everything is going to happen faster and faster from now onwards. If you just track what's happening in the natural First the natural, then the spiritual. I tell you, lightning is coming. Everything is coming faster and faster and faster. Lightning is coming to the sons of grace. Therefore, I constantly say, people that were supposed to betray you next year will betray you tomorrow. Everything is going to move faster and faster. Acceleration. 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 And the Bible says, and the Lord shall blow, the Lord shall blow the trumpet. This is not a trumpet that you will blow. This is a special trumpet. The Lord will blow it to announce his sons. If no one ever blew the trumpet for you, get ready. The Bible says, and they shall go with the whirlwinds of the south. There's a company coming that will not operate in the wind of Pentecost. They will operate in the whirlwind. And a whirlwind is destructive. A whirlwind reorganizes structures. A whirlwind causes reorganization. Some of you are going to operate like the whirlwind. You're going to go back with a reformation mentality. You're going to break down ancient structures. You're going to destroy Neustan. You're going to destroy those molded images, those images in your house, those traditions, that sectarianism, those extra biblical traditions, those centralized systems of government, those programs that you had in your church, that red tape that you had, that inflexibility, that antiquitous practice that you brought into your church, those Nicolational practices you brought into your church. When you go out, I prophesy to you, you're going to go out with a whirlwind. Not the wind of Pentecost. Not the wind of Pentecost. You will touch things that other people are scared to touch. You will go and tell people there's no disappearance. Some of them will disappear, but you're going to get ready to handle that kind of warfare because you're fighting the sons of Greece and they're seated in your church. They have no concept of the spirit. The eyes have not been opened. They don't understand the reality of the spirit. They are sitting in our houses. We're not asking that you should change them, because, uh, to chase them away. But Psalms 2, as Sean read, says you'll break the vessel. You'll break the vessel. You know what that means? You'll not destroy it. You're a potter. You go to the potter's house, he breaks the vessel not to destroy it. He breaks it to recraft it, to reshape it. Amen. We have been not given a ministry of destruction. We have been given a ministry of edification and reconciliation. That's our ministry. But people misinterpret when we talk like this. They think we are pugilistic. They think we are belligerent. No, we have come to help. <laughs> we've come to help you. We've come to help you from being devoured by your own congregation. We've come to your congregation and to tell them, you are not a lecturer. You are not a principal. You are more than all of that. You are their father. And they must know how to honor you. They must know how to receive you. And when they receive you as a father, they receive the grace of the heavenly father. And they become sons of grace. When you've got sons of grace in your church, you don't have to explain everything to them. They just catch things. You just read the first paragraph and they just catch it. You don't have to labor. You then have a low maintenance church. The most beautiful thing to pastor is a low maintenance church because you've got sons that submit to you. They take ownership of your vision. 
They'll support you. They'll honor you. They won't be jealous of you. They won't be familiar with you. You're sons of grace. Church is the most exciting place to be in. But you've got to build it right. You've got to build it right. Don't bring Greek philosophy into the church. The Bible says the Lord of hosts shall defend them. The Lord will be our defense. The Lord will be our protection. And they shall devour. That means we will have victory over our enemies. We will have victory over all our enemies. The Bible says, by this I know that the Lord is pleased with me, that my enemies do not triumph over me. Amen. You will have victory. After this conference, when you go back, you will go back with your head high. You will have victory over all your enemies. The mantle of a king will come upon you. The mantle of a king will come upon you. And the Bible says, they will subdue with sling stones. This is also cryptic language. There was another man who subdued with a sling stone. His name was David. And the scriptures are prophesying that you will be like David. Zechariah 12, 8, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. You will be like David. The weak among you will be like David. God is not restoring the tabernacle of Samson. Because Samson married the Philistine. David killed the Philistine. Samson operated in inspiration. David operated in impartation. Samson overcame for pleasure. David overcame to rule. Samson operated on his own. David operated as a team. Samson did not leave a legacy. David left a legacy. Samson's strength was in his hair. David's strength was in the name of the Lord. Samson had no integrity. David operated in the integrity of the Lord. Samson did not fulfill purpose and mandate. David fulfilled the purposes of the Lord. God is restoring the tabernacle of David. I want to say to you also, God has rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. Psalm 78 verse 16. He's rejected the tabernacle of Joseph because Joseph came under the influence of the sun. He built his tabernacle in Egypt. And Tamu will give you reasons why God rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. Because when Joseph came of age and he became second in charge and he had the golden chariot, he did not go looking for his father because he had come under the influence of the sun. Joseph married an Egyptian woman. Joseph practice divination. He had a silver cup. Joseph introduced punitive taxation that brought the Egyptian into slavery. And what he sowed, the nation reaped. And Joseph said to his people, preserve my bones. That when you go into the promised land, take my bones with you. He forgot about his family. She just said, take me and my family's bones together. And Joseph, whether you like it or not, got his pound of flesh. He got his revenge. He imprisoned Benjamin and he imprisoned Simeon. He made them suffer a bit. That's called revenge. God has rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. He has chosen the tabernacle of David. And it says, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls as the corners of the altar. This is talking about the sons of grace. They shall drink. They shall be drunk with wine wherein there is no excess. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, in spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart, giving thanks always to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. This is the third level of your involvement with the Spirit of God. The first level of your involvement with the anointing and the Spirit of God was when you got saved. The second level is when you got baptized in the Holy Ghost 
and you began to witness and you spoke in other tongues. But the third level is the highest level. The Bible says at this level, you, at the second level, when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you speak in other tongues. The Bible says, he who speaks in another tongue speaks to God. And that seemed to be the highest level, but it's not the highest level. Look at the third level. The Bible says when you are filled with the Spirit, the third level, you then speak to one another. The people that fear the Lord spoke often one to another. You go to churches in Europe, you go to churches in, 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 in America, they are stopped talking to each other. There's no fellowship. And the fellowship is flawed because it's over tea and cake. It's not over the word of the Lord. And the Bible says, there will be Eat, drinking of the Spirit, joy in your heart, gratitude, submission to one another, all those are the signs of being filled with the Spirit. And the Lord the God shall save them in that day as a flock of his people. They will be delivered by the Lord, and they shall be stones as stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. We shall no longer be stones on the ground, for you to be trampled over by everyone. But you shall be stones in his crown. What does that mean? God is going to take you and put you on his head. That's the promotion. That's the promotion for the sons of Zion. He will lift us up. How great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful. And new, and new wine, the maids. Corn refers to the word of God. New wine refers to the spirit. The sons of Zion, the sons of grace, will get the balance right. Word and spirit. And they will be young men. And John tells us who these young men are. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. There's a company called the sons of Zion who will overcome every principality over power. They will trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And the second term used for that company is they will be called virgins. Revelation 14 verses 1 to 4. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. And the Bible says they follow the lamb. These are virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And being a virgin does not mean they're only 144,000. This is a symbolic number. It's a multiple of 12. It's a governmental number. It's talking about the dominion of the sons of grace. The sons of grace. And their dominion is connected to the fact that they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. My time is up. God bless you. We'll talk more later. Amen.